Soviet disc detected. To play the Allied missions, please insert the Allied disc. Our American way of life, isn't it grand? Peace, freedom, and bacon and eggs. Seems perfect. But what if it's not? Friends, your future may not be as secure as you think. Where will you be when the atomic bombs fall? You can secure your family's future by reserving a spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault from vault -Tec. That's right, Bob. Act now, and your family can wait out the horrors of nuclear devastation. And Doris, the vault will have all the amenities of your modern-day home. And it's attractive. And Sally, in the vault, you might meet that special someone, just as you would on the surface. And in a few short years, you and your fellow vault dwellers will repopulate our great country. And Billy, you'll have lots of swell kids to play with. Reserve your family spot in a state-of-the-art underground vault today. Sign up now and prepare for the future. Hello everyone, I'm a Broken Robot. When you think of the Fallout franchise, what comes to mind? Maybe thoughts of the Brotherhood of Steel or NCR, post-apocalyptic factions that have spent over 200 years shaping the ashes of the nuclear wasteland in their own image. Maybe you think of the Nuka-Cola Company and other megacorporations that dominated the pre-war Fallout universe. Or perhaps some of the intellectuals in the audience think of the various mutants and robots that inhabit the wasteland. While any of these would be fine assumptions, today I'd like to talk about what I personally believe makes up the soul of the Fallout franchise, thematically and lore-wise. Today I'd like to discuss the deep lore connections and the overarching philosophy of Project Safehouse, Vault Tech, and the vaults that they built. In order to understand why the vaults are directly linked to the heart of the Fallout franchise, we'll have to go back to the beginning. In the Fallout universe, technology, culture, and history takes a wide turn compared to that of the real world. A combination of the circuit board never being invented combined with the scientific adoption of nuclear energy gives the Fallout universe a retro-futuristic aspect in more ways than one. Fusion-powered robots would paint white picket fences, and the average adult would drive a fusion-powered car along a sky highway only to end up working a boring desk job. This clash of the extraordinary and mundane comes in more ways than one in the Fallout universe. While someone who is unfamiliar with the Fallout franchise and its lore might view pre-war America and society as a whole like a shining castle on the hill, the truth is that, much like in real life, things couldn't be so simple. Pre-war America was very cutthroat and a cynical place on multiple levels. Military contractors created technologies like power armor, advanced laser weaponry, and robots that could turn an enemy into a pile of ash, but most Americans wouldn't expect these advances in defense technology to be used against American citizens when food shortages caused riots. Mega corporations like Poseidon Energy, Nuka-Cola, and Robco could provide the American population with the consumer goods and lifestyles that they desired at the cost of polluting local environments, forcing workers into subhuman conditions, and making record profits during a time when most pre-war Americans were dealing with hyperinflation, spun on by a mix of the breakdown of the UN and corrupt politicians working with the same corporations that saw pre-war Americans as nothing more than pawns in an elaborate game. Speaking of politicians in the Fallout universe, the US government was downright evil, going as far as to imprison American citizens for no reason, experiment on unaware US populations, and gamble the state of the world on half-hearted attempts to line their own pockets. Resource shortages would lead to the United States and China going to war over the last reserves of oil, and as the tension grew and paranoia worsened after conflicts in Alaska, most Americans assumed that the nuclear holocaust was inevitable, which is where vault Tech comes in. While other pre-war companies like General Atomics, Poseidon Energy, and Armco planned to milk the American people for all they were worth, vault Tech, who directly partnered with the United States civil defense planners and other high government officials, offered a rare glimpse of hope in desperate times. Good morning! vault Tech calling! vault Tech? Remind me again. Why, we're about you, ma'am. And helping secure your future. You see, vault Tech is the foremost builder of state-of-the-art underground fallout shelters. Vaults, if you will. Luxury accommodations where you can wait out the horrors of nuclear devastation. You can't begin to know how happy I am to finally speak with you. 
I've been trying for days. It's a matter of utmost urgency, I assure you. What's so important? Why, nothing less than your entire future. If you haven't noticed, ma'am, this country has gone to heck in a handbasket. If you'll excuse my language, the big kaboom is... It's inevitable, I'm afraid. And coming sooner than you may think, if you catch my meaning. Now, I know you're a busy woman, so I won't take up much of your time. Time being, um... <laughs> A precious commodity. I'm here today to tell you that because of your family service to our country, you have been pre-selected for entrance into the local vault. Vault 111. Project Safehouse was a plan established by vault Tech to allow the American way of life to continue in the event of total atomic annihilation. The plan originally was for 100,000 Americans to be placed in over 100 separate advanced fallout shelters called vaults. While it was a pretty penny to get into the vaults, they promised luxury that almost made some people look forward to the apocalypse. All vaults were advertised as being stocked with ultra-modern living conditions, state-of-the-art robots, and most importantly enough entertainment and supplies to last the population of a small town till the surface would become habitable again. Entire families pulled funds together to reserve just a single slot in a vault. And when that fateful day came on October 23rd, 2077, when China and the United States went toe-to-toe -to -toe in all-out nuclear war, many Americans, despite not reserving slots in local vaults, still seek them out anyways in hopes of being let in. In post-war America, the vaults would stand out as the final bastion of the American way of life. All vaults would be connected by a mother vault called Vault Zero, which would house vault tech workers and staff to help regulate and watch over vault operations. While it depended on the region and how bad the nuclear war would be, vault had initially planned for most vaults to open up after just 5-10 to 10 years. Each vault would be given a radically new piece of technology called the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, which could be used to turn irradiated environments into lush pre-war standards of life. Thanks to the vaults, post-war America would be light years ahead of China and other war-torn remains of once rival nations. And within a century, some even believed that America would be rebuilt better than before. When the vault doors finally sealed and the world above ground went dark, the illusion that vault Tech had curated would soon show its true colors. Most vaults were far from what the inhabitants had expected, and many vaults ended up being more than just shelters to save a few Americans rich and smart enough to reserve a slot in one of the vault Tech shelters. What was likely more concerning was that many vaults were far more than just a simple fallout shelter to protect life. Before the Great War that sent the human race back to a new dark age, vault Tech and their partners in the US government were planning something far more nefarious that was being bankrolled by the very vault dwellers that they claimed to be protecting. Behind the bright smiles and flashy advertisements, vault Tech was just as corrupt as the rest of them. From evidence found in Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 at the various vault Tech offices, we learned that vault Tech planned to use the vaults to test new scientific breakthroughs, social experiments, and cruel scenarios so that post-war factions of surviving elites could use this data for their own use. Many of the vault dwellers soon realized that not only did most vaults hold less than adequate accommodations, but they were lied to by vault Tech. Vaults that were designed for social experiments were used to test the human limit under stress and how society could adapt to bizarre and barbaric situations. Some of these experiments were tamer, like Vault 15 that was purposely populated with US citizens of diverse and different backgrounds, or as reckless as Vault 43, which staffed a vault large enough to house a thousand people, but it was only housed with 20 men, 10 women, and a full-grown adult panther. Other social experiments had darker implications, like Vault 11 that ordered dwellers to sacrifice one vault resident per year or the entire vault would perish. Other vaults, like Vault 19, directly encouraged radical results, separating the vault population into two isolated groups with pre-planned attempts to make the groups weary and paranoid about each other in order to encourage violence. Some vault experiments were more upfront. Even though vault residents would sometimes consider going against these experiments, many vaults were still staffed with vault tech employees and security guards that would be more than happy to gun down disobedient dwellers. Some experiments were passive, like Vault 42, which was stocked entirely with light bulbs no brighter than 40 watts, forcing dwellers to adapt to a dim environment to test the long-term effects of darkness. Or there were some vaults, like Vault 12, which was designed for its door to purposely not close entirely, to let in small amounts of radiation to see if a lightly irradiated population was more suited for the wasteland. Even if your vault wasn't a social or scientific experiment, that didn't mean that you wouldn't end up being a lab rat. 
Sometimes vault populations were treated like lab rats, to be abused and used by vault tech scientists for a multitude of reasons. Vault 75 attempted to make genetically perfect humans through extreme mental and physical testing. Vault 87 got to use their population as guinea pigs to be experimented on with the forced evolutionary virus, which would turn the majority of the vault into mindless super mutants. Even in vaults that were designed specifically for science and staffed by scientists, vault tech was often cruel and careless. In Vault 22, spores were used to perfect plant growth, at the cost of vault residents becoming infected with mutant spores. Or Vault 81, that sought to cure all known human diseases at the cost of killing off an entire vault worth of people. When it was all said and done, only about 17 vaults were actually designed to protect and house their inhabitants, but rarely did these groups survive to one day open up to the wider wasteland. <laughs> Before we begin this episode of the Adventures of Captain Cosmos, we've got a message from the fine folks at Pulaski Preservation Services, purveyors of products there when you actually need them. Seems there's been a lot of talk these days about vault life, but not all of us have the luxury to spend so much on something that, frankly, we may not actually need. Unlike those other guys, the sensible folks at Pulaski Preservation Services have created an affordable line of personal protection products to make sure no one gets left behind. Personal protection, there when you actually need it. Remember, that's Pulaski Preservation Shelters, simply there when you actually need them. Exact change only. And now on to our show, The Adventures of Captain Cosmos, co-starring Jangles, the Moon Monkey. Even if you're familiar with the Fallout franchise, you may ask yourself, what was the point of all of this? For those of you that know your Fallout lore, you'll know that an enclave of vault tech executives and high-ranking military officials would go on to form a military faction of a post-war US military fighting force, fittingly called the Enclave. The worst part is that despite the major loss of life and mass human suffering that would take place in the underground metal coffins that were the vaults, their data and experiment results would never be used to anyone's benefit, and in some cases would actively go on to hurt the wasteland. Part of Project Safe House was for the Enclave to use Vault Zero as a staging ground to build a massive generation spaceship that could travel for hundreds of years before reaching its destination. The idea was that if the Earth was uninhabitable, the Enclave elites would use a spaceship to find a habitable planet to colonize and use the vault experiments to test out how to build a perfect society. These ships would house the Enclave elites who would hide out on an offshore oil rig until the ship was ready for takeoff. The only issue was that no such ship was ever built, and worst of all, depending on how you feel towards the canonness of Fallout tactics, when Vault Zero was designed, it was intended for the brightest minds to be surgically plugged into a supercomputer matrix of thousands of individuals, allowing them to use their minds combined with the machine to help create a better future. Robots would complete the work that required physical action, and the few human dwellers inside the vault would be relegated to menial labor. The only issue was that due to a mix of budget cuts and poor oversight by vault tech themselves, computer errors would cause many of the human brains plugged into the supercomputer to become lobotomized and the few survivors that wouldn't have their minds wiped lost any sense of self and stripped away any sense of personality, merging into one computer system that would come into play during the events of Fallout Tactics. The original $23 billion that was planned to be used to fund Vault Zero was used to line the pockets of Vault Tech executives, and only about $2.3 billion were actually used for the vault, explaining why so many of the brightest minds in the old United States trusted a machine that would essentially lobotomize them when they thought they would be turned into living supercomputers. Vault Zero going dark just after a few months ended any hopes for Vault Tech to maintain that network of vaults, even if it was an overpromised lie. Additionally, despite vault Tech having plans for employees to continue work long after the bombs dropped, a mix of human instincts and the breakdown of the chain of command meant almost zero employees attempted to actually show up for maintenance calls or assist vaults when they sent out distress signals. It's unknown how vault Tech planned to keep their entire corporation running after the bombs dropped, but evidence in Fallout 4 shows that some vaults, like Vault 88, had the ability to contact vault Tech employees through the radio to request supplies or assistance. When the Enclave lost contact with Vault Zero after just a few months, they immediately took the Generation Ship's plan off the table. Additionally, while the Enclave was able to extract some data from Vault 13 and Vault 15, in Fallout 2, as of now in the Fallout timeline, basically all data collected by the internal vault computers was lost or unused. When reflecting on the position of the vaults in the Fallout series, they truly take on a role of not only the heart of the franchise itself, but the very soul of the story. 
While Fallout often uses bright colors, charming music, and nostalgic visuals to draw in players, so did vault when selling slots of Project Safehouse. On a more philosophical level, however, the vaults mean far much more to the very soul of the Fallout lore. Many pre-war companies held the status of being all-American wholesome trailblazers heading towards a brighter future, when in reality they were crooked, negligent, and downright evil. After the bombs dropped and bit by bit wastelanders learned the truth about these pre-war relics, and the same could be said for the vaults. Despite the vaults holding a mixed status in post-war America, it's often more negative than positive. While wastelanders get excited when they see a bright blue and yellow jumpsuit, the tall tales of vaults full of feral ghouls and super mutants lead most wastelanders to stay just where they are, in the wasteland. But this isn't a bad thing, in fact, some could say that it sheds a more positive light on the franchise. Despite these vaults being propped up as pre-war sanctuaries, they are often gloomy death traps that are more than the stuff of nightmares. The reality is that the vaults are a representation of mankind's own faults, whether it be greed, violence, or downright parasitic behaviors. But out in the wasteland, while there are hardships, you can find people rebuilding and working together for mutual benefit. The vaults represented internalized greed that consumed pre-war America, much like a rad scorpion eating its own tail. Hope in terms of the wider fallout narrative can't be found in concrete holes in the ground, or in desperate plots of self-preservation on another planet, but in building community, helping others, and making sacrifices for the better of all. I could even go as far to say that if pre-war America spent as much effort preventing the nuclear apocalypse as they did preparing for it, then it likely would have never happened in the first place. The vaults play well into the themes of Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 2, with the idea of not looking towards the past for guidance, but walking into the future with your head on straight. The vaults survive as a link to a long-dead civilization of corrupt bureaucrats, a sheep-like population, and a careless government. The vaults serve as a reminder that humanity was so eager to blow each other up that they built entire fallout shelters just to continue human suffering anyway in the form of the vault experiments. The pre-war world should be picked clean for its technology and useful knowledge, but much like the power structures, attitudes, and procedures of vault tech and the vault societies they created, they should be left buried and reflected on with weary interest. Many vault dwellers would go on to do great things for the wasteland, showing that even in a socially toxic environment like Vault 101 and Vault 13, or evil experiments like Vault 34 and Vault 111, the people inside can leave their preserved safety of their pre-war coffins, and accept the harsh truth but optimism that comes with accepting the wasteland and the people who inhabit it. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video and can take away some insight from my rambling. I'm a huge fan of the Fallout franchise and had a blast making this video. So if you'd be interested in other Fallout video essays, let me know in the comments down below. But more than anything, I'm so thankful and blessed to have each and every one of you in my audience today. Your viewership helps a robot like me get out of his charging dock each and every morning. If you like what you see, why not hit that like button? If you like this video, it lets me know that you guys want more content, and it helps me out personally in the YouTube algorithm. So hey, thanks a bunch. Also, if you don't want to miss my future video essays, reviews, and commentary on whatever topic of the week piques my interest, feel free to stick around. I hope you all have a great day, go brush up on some Fallout lore, and stay cool.